On the 25th of March in 2003, the Minister for Science, Mr Peter McGoran, rose in the Australian Parliament and tabled the MARTAC report. MARTAC was a six-person committee set up to advise the Minister on the progress of the partial clean-up of the old atomic bomb test site at Maralinga in South Australia. I was previously a member of that committee. I was also the department's representative overseeing the project, and so was the link between the project and the committee. When I was removed from the project, the committee lost that link and had to refer to the project manager for information about the project. That loss of contact shows throughout the report. And I was one of the five members who had extensive first-hand experience in the nuclear industry. Towards the end of 1997, I advised the department not to extend the contract with the project management company to cover the second phase of the project but my advice was rejected and my contract with the department was cancelled. Also, even though he did not have the authority to do so, the public servant who terminated my contract also cancelled my membership of the committee, so I had no involvement at all in writing the report. As an aside, it seems that the department could not find anybody in Australia to replace me on the committee, so paid an American to travel to these shores three or four times a year to attend meetings. Whoever wrote the minister's speech used more spin than even Shane Warne could impart. The minister claimed the project achieved its goals and a world's best practice result, and the partial clean-up would now allow unrestricted access to about 90% of the 3,200 square kilometre site. The department could have simply erected a fence around the most contaminated area, and that would have allowed unrestricted access to 90% of the land. He acknowledged that there was an area of some 120 square kilometres surrounding that where soil had been removed, which was still, in his words, lightly contaminated. But he failed to mention that some contamination around the Taji Ground Zero is up to 300 times higher than the clean-up criteria. While the minister claimed the report would be a valuable guide to others facing similar clean-ups, it doesn't describe problems encountered or how they were overcome, such as the suppression of dust or the removal of the final specks of plutonium. Mr McGoran loved that term, world's best practice, even though it has no meaning. Consider the fact that only 1% of the area contaminated above the clean-up criteria was cleaned. That means that clean-up of the whole area would be far from world's best practice, and that is a ridiculous notion. And consider also that the department rejected the advice of its own committee in how to treat 21 pits containing hundreds of tonnes of debris contaminated with plutonium and adopted a procedure proposed by an engineer with no nuclear experience in order to save an estimated $5 million. That begs the question of why have an advisory committee comprising six eminent scientists, to use the minister's words, if you ignore them, and then compound it by taking advice from someone not qualified to give it. Mr Albanese followed the minister and ridiculed the minister's claim to world's best practice. 
He described the outcome as a cheap and nasty solution which failed to meet international standards. I have never met Mr Albanese, nor have I ever spoken to him, but he went on to say, Alan Parkinson has also been the subject of denigration. That is certainly true, and much of it downright lies. As soon as I heard that the report had been released, I went onto the net and started to read it. I then went to the government bookshop in Canberra to buy a copy, but was told it was still under embargo. But within half an hour, Senator Kim Carr had given me three copies, which I took home to read. The report was accompanied by a CD, which contains many attachments and appendices, but the CD is not available on the net, so readers will not be aware that what is in the body of the report sometimes differs from what is on the CD. I had already seen earlier drafts and knew what to expect, so I kept a red pen handy as I scanned the pages. To say that the report was a shocker would be an understatement. I think it can be best summed up by some roadside signs which say one thing and then say the opposite. I spotted many mistakes and noted them in a document which ran to over 18,000 words and I had to stop writing. There were far too many mistakes for me to list in this video, but my critique was tabled in the Senate on the 16th of June 2003 by Senator Lynn Allison. I also included a chapter about the report and its shortcomings in my book about the project. Several of the members of MARTAC contacted me to say that writing the report would be very hard without my input. Some asked the department to arrange for my input to the report, but their intransigence remained, which saved me from refusing. The first mistake appears where the authors included the committee's terms of reference. Those quoted are the draft terms that we changed at our first meeting. It degenerated from there. When the authors did not have details of the project, they used generalities such as heavily contaminated, generally highly active, significant debris, or terms such as burial at depth, relatively shallow depth, or rebury at depth, and these latter words led to an amusing exchange in a Senate hearing when the chief nuclear regulator tried to explain what they meant. Senator Allison asked, Would you describe all of the pits as being deep burial? To which Dr. Loy said, I would describe them as being buried at depth. Where you define deep, I guess, is a matter of taste. There are several examples of statements that are not clear as to their meaning, and they remind me of a sign in our local shopping area. For example, on page 245 is the term 10 kilobecquels per gram of plutonium-239. Should that be 10 kilobecquels of plutonium per gram of something, or is it 10 kilobecquels of something else, per gram of plutonium. The authors confused health physics procedures, which were submitted to me for approval on behalf of the department, with work procedures, which were internal documents entirely for project purposes. The report claimed that this graph in the report was used to control melt temperature when vitrifying the pit debris. Dale Timmons the geochemical expert who designed the geochemistry repeatedly told them they were wrong, but they ignored him. And there was some sloppy editing, but perhaps the editors could be excused. Just one of many examples is on page 94, where a table contains many errors showing, for example, that capping of the main trenches started 
before they had finished filling them with contaminated soil. And according to the table, it took 14 days to exhume a pit at Weewag, but only two days to exhume three pits at the TM site, and one of those was a very large pit, some 60 metres long by 10 wide by 3 metres deep. And there was careless use of symbols. Capital T is the symbol for Tesla, the strength of a magnetic field, and yet the report uses it often in reference to the size of an atomic explosion. If they wanted to refer to the explosion, why not spell it out as they did on page 377? The biggest howler is in a footnote on page 114. Yes, the ratio of plutonium to americium does decline over the first 70 years or so, as plutonium-241 decays to americium-241. But then, as no more americium is produced, the ratio of plutonium to americium does not decline as stated in the report. It rises steadily to infinity as the americium itself disappears. This fact also introduces something that seems to be constantly ignored. The way that the presence of plutonium is detected at Marolinga is because of the attendant americium. But when the americium has all disappeared in the next few hundred years, it will be all but impossible to detect the plutonium that will be there for the next quarter of a million years. Another of the simple mistakes also appears on that page, where it is stated that the line for the boundary markers was delineated in 1998. That is a year after they were installed. The choice of photographs was strange. There was a photo of Tufi, which was to have been the site for the next atomic explosion, but did not figure in the partial clean-up. Strangely, there were no photographs to show the disgusting state of the pits at Taranaki, with concrete caps that were far too small to cover the pits, and many tons of debris outside the pits. And there were no photographs to show the damage to the ISV hood after the explosion at one of the pits. To show their ignorance of work procedures, they included a photograph that showed project rules being broken, with a scraper dumping contaminated soil on the dry part of the trench instead of onto the watered portion. Will we ever hear the truth about the Manolinga experience? As I said at the start, I had no involvement at all in writing the report. I am not mentioned even as a previous member in spite of the fact that I attended 10 of their 17 meetings plus several splinter meetings. Although they do mention my company, Kylewind, on page 57. But on page 336, I feature in one of the photographs. Oh dear, another mistake.